Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today, Christian Harloff. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Collider Movie Talk. It's going to be a lot of fun today as we get through all the movie discussions, but a couple of announcements real quick before the panel is announced. Wanted to let you guys know that we are doing a meet and greet at Comic-Con. We've been letting you guys know, but it's got a little bit of a change. We're going to be doing now from 5, 5 o'clock to 7 p.m. at the Comic-Con HQ headquarters right near the Fox Sports and Grill, Fox Sports Grill. So at the convention center, make sure you check out. We'll be doing that. Then we're going to move over to the Fox Sports Grill around 7 o'clock. But come there around 5 or 7, come meet and greet with us. Another thing is, very because Star Wars Celebration just went down. There was a lot of stuff. If you haven't watched the recaps that I did with Perry Nemiroff, who was there on the floor. Those are on the channel right now. We, we did Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And then John Campia and Dennis both did a re, live react. excuse me, a reaction to Rebels Season 3 trailer. But because of the recap, we're going to do a Jedi Council because of Comic-Con, myself, Mark Riley and John Campia are going to do a live Jedi Council today at around 1 p.m. live. So make sure you check that out. No Jedi Council on Thursday. Just going to be a live show today at 1. That was a lot of talking. Ashley, what's it next? It was. Dennis is also here. <laughs> Uh, just to be clear, the meet and greet is from five to nine, Oops. so we're not, uh. we're not. It's not five to seven. We're doing five to seven at the Comic Con HQ uh, area, which is actually right outside of Fox Sports Grill, so it's not that far off. It's just after that they're gonna kick us out of there, and then we're right. just gonna hang out at the I was Fox close. Sports Grill for, I was close. for a couple hours. And yeah, Star Wars Celebration stuff. I was watching all your stuff and, and Perry stuff. Perry did some cool uh, Facebook live streaming yep. from the floor, and I felt like. Kind of felt like I was there. <laughs> We've also got a special guest, Jason Inman. Yes, uh, I'm excited to be here, and I'm also excited to uh, be appearing at that Collider meetup, where yes. uh, if you come there and show me, the ep you tell me the episode of Star Trek where George, uh, where Captain Kirk's brother showed up in, I'll buy you a beer. Oh. Nice. My that goodness. means that you never showed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's Monday, which means it's time for the weekend box office Wait, report. Nope. I'm waiting. I gotta cut you off real quick. All right, thank uh, you. Because something else dropped that you were not aware of and that is the well, you, magnificent you were silent. seven you I were know, silent so then i had to like <laughs> jump in there i know i'm sorry magnificent seven trailer went up today and uh we did a jason and i both did a review slash reaction it'll be up in the channel in a little bit but we want to do a quick review of it so you guys kind of knew what was going on with the trailer this thing dropped and i have to tell you i loved it i liked the teaser a lot mm -hmm. um but this one to me it just it, what they did really well was the fact that they set up both uh, Pratt and Denzel showing you just who we were getting in this movie, but then they started peppering in the actual seven throughout. I thought it was a brilliant trailer. The fact that it's coming out in September is, is again, very smart, the way that they're setting this up. How do you feel about it? I mean, usually I'm against remakes, but there is enough in this trailer that makes me convinced that this could be as an equal or not better than the original. And it has a really amazing look to it. Like the action pieces right. seem like they're gonna play really strong and the cinematography is really strong in it. Uh, Dennis? I really liked it as well, and I, I don't mind it being a remake. I mean, Magnificent Seven, the original is a remake anyways of, yeah. of Kurosawa's Seven. Seven Samurai, which I'm also, the, I love Seven Samurai. Magnificent Seven, on the other hand, is a, to me a good Western. I know it's a classic. You watch out every, what you every, say about Yul Brenner. Watch it. Everyone <laughs> loves it. Personally, it's not one of my favorite yeah. Westerns, the John Sturgis one. So. For for me, I'm excited for this one and the action and the tone of it. Right. And you know, even the modern music didn't really bother me. I know we had mentioned before, like with Assassin's Creed, how we didn't like the yeah. modern music, but that I don't know for some reason it fits in this one versus that one. I think it fit more. I still I'm just not a fan of contemporary music okay. in the the period pieces. I agree that it definitely fit better than Assassin's Creed and even some of the other the the Star Trek stuff. That but but. I, I'm just not a fan of it. I just it throws me out, but it didn't take away from the trailer overall. I just I loved the trailer. And I'm Peter, with Christian on that. Yeah, Peter Sarsgaard. He looks like a nice menacing villain. Yeah. He plays that yeah. role so well. It's a good creep. Yeah, he really is. And <laughs> I love Bearded D'Onofrio. That grizzly. He looks like uh, Wilfred Brimley. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right, Ashley, what's our first official topic? Can I talk? Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. All, right. All right, it's Monday, Wait. which means <laughs> it's time for the Weekend Box Office Report, brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. The Secret Life of Pets continued its dominating run at the box office, snagging the number one spot for the second week in a row with $50.5 million, bringing its domestic total to an impressive $203.1 million after just 10 days in release. The animated movie already places higher than Disney's Tangled and just behind Pixar's Ratatouille on the all-time animated chart. Finishing at the number two spot was Sony's Ghostbusters, which took in $46 million, representing the largest domestic opening for both director Paul Feig and Melissa McCarthy. Taking the number three spot was The Legend of Tarzan with $11.1 million, bringing its domestic total past the $100 million mark with $103 million. At number four, Disney and Pixar's Finding Dory, which is now the highest grossing animated release of all time domestically, adding $11 million to its domestic total of $445.5 million. Rounding out the top five is Mike and Dave Need Wedding Dates with $7.5 million for a domestic total of $31.3 million. Christian, thoughts on Ghostbusters not taking the number one spot? Um, that doesn't surprise me. I think we all predicted it just throughout the backlash and what it was tracking at. I, it actually hit lower than I thought. I thought it was going to do around 54 or 55, but um, it, you know, whether it's just another remake, regardless of all the other issues that people were or weren't having with it, people the remakes of classics, no matter what it is, it just they just haven't really done well. There might be a couple of ones that have, but for the most part, they just aren't working or people aren't getting that enthused about them. For me, the thing that stands out, it's not pets because pets, the premise alone, the capital, it was a hundred million or whatever it was, 105 last week and it hit to go, but just around 50% or whatever it was. That's not that surprising. It's the three, four and five. All three of those movies with, with Tarzan and Mike and Dave and, and Dory and Dory, they just keep peppering. And it's just the Tarzan and Mike and Dave specifically, because Dory we knew was going to be this beast of a movie. But the way that Mike and Mike and Dave, we thought that was how much movie that was going to make in its run. And the fact that it is doing that, those types of numbers, it's already a success. $35 million or whatever the budget was. You know, I haven't seen the film yet, but from what I heard, some people didn't like it, but it doesn't matter because it's doing what the studio wanted it to. And Tarzan, getting over $100 million, I didn't like that movie at all. But I can tell you that that's... that's more of a hit because I thought when it opened up, I was like, ah, this, that's not that big. It's not that big of an opening, and it's still staying in there. So, um, yeah, it would be the three, four, and five that stand out to me. How about you, Dennis? Well, definitely Ghostbusters is what everyone's going to be talking about. Sure. And, and for me, the box office results of that actually kind of mirror and reflect how I feel about the movie, where it's not <laughs> a bomb. Yeah. But it also wasn't great. I, I, I thought it could have been a lot better. There's a lot of potential, a lot of stuff they left on the table. They could have made the movie. But it was kind of much to do about nothing. Like, I, I saw it and I was like, well, this isn't the crap fest that sure. people claim it to be. And it wasn't that great either. So I, I think Sony's going to watch and see how much, how, how, how much legs it has over the next few weeks. And then also internationally on whether they're going to take this another sequel and, and also spin it off into other properties. And yeah. Finding Dory is now, I think, the number one, uh, at least for the domestic market, uh, animated film of all time. It, it, it surpassed, I think, Shrek 2 or Shrek wow. 3. It, it, it's made so much money. And, and it's only, how many weeks has it been only for that? Four or something? Four, four weeks. Something like, yeah. It's still going to keep going. So yeah. that's another notable thing. I mean, yeah, I, I'm as well. I'm not surprised by this Ghostbusters at all because they said that it was Paul Feig's largest opening. I'm also surprised that... This kind of tells me that Sony must have known or been tracking this, that they were like, well, we're giving this to the guy who opens at 30 million, you know, and do we really expect him to open a movie at 100 million? Like, I mean, that should have been a little well, even bit. Even with of, the Ghostbusters title, though? I don't know, you know, but but this this movie kind of had like um, an anchor on pulling it back the entire time from the very beginning, you know, just for being the remake and all that yeah. stuff like that. And you brought up the interesting thing about the three, four, and five spots. And I kind of wonder, it's it'll be curious to see how Ghostbusters does the second weekend. Now it has two big things playing against it. It has Star Trek coming at it hard and it has San Diego Comic-Con. Right. So it'll be interesting to see if Ghostbusters just disappears and maybe Finding Dory beats it next weekend or if Ghostbusters can still hold at the two or three spot. I think that th that's a great point because you got a movie like Tarzan that stays in there, Mike and Dave that stays in there. 
for me, I don't know if Ghostbusters is going to stay in there. I don't know the kind of staying power it yeah. has, and because it does have a bit of a crossover audience, a bit with uh, Star Trek for sure. I mean, it's it's comedy, but still, it's it's kind of the genre mm-hmm. film. And then you're right with Comic Con, and then I don't and people the buzz hasn't been great on the movie. Because if you make a remake of a classic and people are going, that's ah, not a crap fest. That's not an endorsement. <laughs> it really, I mean, yeah, it wasn't as horrible as we thought it was going to be. And some people actually were. Yeah, but up, you're never going to put that on a poster. It yeah, wasn't yeah. as no, bad well, as I, I mean, thought it, it was. Look, 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 I was like one of the last people to see. I saw it last night over here at the AMC Prime. And like, I thought it was like, okay, but there was a big contingent of the audience that was like laughing, like hysterically Good. at it. So maybe that's the audience that Yeah, but I just don't know if that's gonna repeat business though. I just, yeah. I mean, for me, it's just a matter of, I'm always under the philosophy, it doesn't matter who's in the movie. If you're going to make a remake of a movie that is beloved, you either have to make it as good or better in order to do a remake. And that's anything, that's not just Ghostbusters or a comedy, that's any movie you feel like you wanna remake. What's the take that is going, and I'm not saying that they don't think that this is better. It just clearly with audiences and with critics hasn't hit that level. So it's just a tricky thing because I, 44 million, whatever the hell it made for the amount of the budget and the marketing, Mm -hmm. they need to do a lot. They need to do internationally and to do really well. They need to do a lot in order for this thing to. And we've already talked about that this movie is not going to China now. So that's gonna hurt it as well. Yeah. All right, what's next? It was a huge weekend for Star Wars fans over in Europe at Star Wars Celebration. And in the last panel called Future Filmmakers, Star Wars Episode Eight writer-director Ryan Johnson revealed that for the first time in Star Wars history, Episode Eight will begin right where Episode Seven left off with no time jump. Speaking at the panel, Johnson said, You come into it with feelings of deep nostalgia, but then you realize your responsibility ultimately is to get beyond that very quickly and ultimately tell a story that feels alive right now. Johnson also spoke about some of the differences between The Force Awakens and Episode 8, saying, While Force Awakens is an explosion of adventure and excitement, Episode 8 is where you start kind of zooming in on the characters, getting to the heart of them, challenging them, pushing them deeper. In that same panel, young Han Solo directors Phil Lord and Chris Miller officially announced Alden Ehrenreich as Han Solo. Lord and Miller then revealed that they saw 3,000 people for the role, including Taron Egerton and Jack Rayner, revealing that also Ehrenreich did a screen test on the Millennium Falcon with Chewbacca. Star Wars Episode 8 opens on December 15, 2017, with the untitled Han Solo film opening on May 25, 2018. Dennis, what do you think about the official reveal that Episode will pick up immediately after The Force Awakens. It's not a huge surprise because they released that clip earlier this year that showed <laughs> Ryan Johnson shooting that same exact scene. I mistakenly thought they were going to just use some of the stuff they had shot for Episode 7, but I guess the, because it left off, it's going to leave off right right there. They, they had to pick it back up. and then start. I'm glad they're doing this because in, in sequels, and especially in like television series, if you watch TV a lot, and you see when they go to the next season, it's always like three months later, six months later, and you kind of pick up and you miss a lot of the storyline. I don't think this is something that we can miss. This is Ray meeting Luke for the first time, or maybe for the first time, but having, (laughs) having those conversations I feel like we as the fans would be cheated if we didn't get to see that. How about the Han Solo stuff? The Han Solo stuff, I mean, we we had our... uh, When they said, like, oh, it's official now, I was like, oh, it wasn't official already? So it was just... Yeah, it didn't really care that much. I was like, okay, we already knew that. Yeah, like I mentioned at the top of the show, we're doing a live Jedi Council, and you'll get my thoughts, John Campion and Mark Riley's thoughts, on everything we thought about the news uh, or lack thereof uh, that came out of Star Wars Celebration. So if you want to watch all that stuff. But as far as the news that did come out, yeah, I'm with Dennis here. We've, we knew all this stuff. We, it was great to confirm it but we pretty much knew that it was picking up. I'm not gonna totally buy into that video that they released was shot that day. I wouldn't be surprised, and I don't know if we're ever gonna hear this or not, I wouldn't be surprised if Ryan Johnson shot the end of episode seven. I mm-hmm. wouldn't be surprised if that particular scene was shot by Ryan Johnson leading into anything else he needed for episode eight because of the location of Skelly Michael Island. It's not that easy to just go back and forth. I know that they did do that. They picked up some other shots to go back there, but I think they're gonna shoot a lot more there. So don't be surprised if Ryan Johnson actually shot that stuff and they just released it to further promote episode eight. But to hear that it's not jumping, um, it's cool. We need changes. We've always wanted to do changes. Even in the featurette that they showed for Rogue One, and hearing Gareth Edwards talk about how you want to pay you know, respects to the things that had come before you but still do things on your own, that's clearly what Ryan Johnson is doing. And another 
thing that was not a huge reveal, but it's great to hear that we kind of knew already was that Ryan Johnson is going to be focusing in on the characters and get to the heart of the characters. You have to go that route, and that's also what Ryan Johnson does and does well. So in order to do that in episode eight, you knew that that was going to happen. The way that they set everything up in episode seven, I know the new characters, I know the tone, I know what we're getting back into, but give me more about them. Get into the heart of them, similar to what Empire did. So yeah, and as far as Han Solo goes, okay, we knew it. We knew it already. I mean, and then they they put out that press release and said, oh, guess who's it? We knew it already. It's like the cat was out of the bag, even though we're confirming it. It, Come on, we we knew it already. It just, it was cool to have him out there. It was very cool that the kid got to go out there and experience this is what you're getting into. You're Han Solo now. Uh, that was nice for the fans. They didn't live stream it, which I totally don't understand at all. There was nothing shown. Why didn't they live stream it to everyone? Especially they want to promote this kid mm-hmm. as Han Solo. But, okay. I mean, yeah, it, this... For me, a lot of Star Wars celebration was like non-news. Like you're like the guy. We yeah. knew he was Han Solo, um, and we knew that the scene was happening. But I will say that this scene, starting immediately, episode eight at the beginning of Force, at the end of Force Awakens, uh, brings an interesting conundrum to me because, um, for me, that was the weakness of Force Awakens because I was like, "Here we go, here we go, credits," yeah. and I was like. So I wonder, and, and this is going to be a very difficult scene. I bet this was an amazingly hard scene to write. I wonder if this will feel like we are watching the actual end of The Force Awakens being stapled on the top of episode eight, mm-hmm. or if they're going to be able to work it in organically. Because no matter how they do this scene, this scene is either going to be amazing and knock our socks off or it's going to be awkward and clunky because we're sort of ending the movie that we saw last year yeah or they could you know that's why it's interesting because they could cheat and skip ahead and oh it's six months into her training already and like we skipped all that stuff but i think Mm -hmm. they're they're gonna go for it but you're right it 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 it's either going to be a home run or it's going to be really... Well, they could also do a thing where we see this scene and then we fade to that six uh, months no, later. No, that will be terrible. <laughs> that will yeah. be terrible. Yeah. Ashley, what's next? Warner Brothers and Legendary have unveiled the first official image from Kong Skull Island helmed by Kings of Summer director Jordan Voight Roberts. Speaking about the movie to Entertainment Weekly, Voight Roberts said, We're very explicitly not telling the Beauty and the Beast story. The original is a classic. The 70s version is great for what it is and Peter Jackson's version is a great great retelling of the 1933 film. The thing that most interested me was how big do you need to make Kong so that when someone lands on this island and doesn't believe in the idea of myth, the idea of wonder, when we live in a world of social and civil unrest and everything is crumbling around us and technology and facts are taking over, how big does this creature need to be so that when you stand on the ground and you look up at it, the only thing that can go through your mind is that's a god. The movie will also serve as a setup to the main event as Legendary builds to a Godzilla vs. King Kong movie, now set as a shared universe over at Warner Brothers. Brie Larson, Tom Hiddleston, Samuel L. Jackson, John Goodman, John C. Riley, and Toby Kebbell round out the cast for Kong Skull Island with a release set for March 10, 2017. Jason, what do you think of the new image from Kong Skull Island? I think the image looks really cool. I think this little image has gotten me excited. I think it also has led me to believe that I would be blown away if we don't see a trailer this week oh, yeah. for this movie. Like, I would just be blown away. Um, this is an idea that, like, I'm finally excited that we're finally going to take the idea of King Kong, which, uh, which is a big, stupid monster movie, and make him fight everything. And my hope is that somehow we can lead down the road to where they cross over the Pacific Rim universe oh, yeah. as well. And so we can see King Kong punch a Jaeger. But um, <laughs> there's not much to go for. I mean, the size and the magnitude of that skull in the background really does give you the impression that he is that, that, this monkey is a god. That's an interesting idea. I just hope that they can pull off in this movie what I think Peter Jackson didn't pull off was the idea that this island is this really scary place that humans should not go to. In the in the Peter Jackson movie, it just seems silly. Um, I agree with you. I, I really love the image, and I like everything I'm hearing about this movie so far, what this comment means to me is that's them saying, don't worry, he'll be as big as Godzilla. (laughs) That's what everyone has been saying. It's like, Godzilla was huge in that Garrett Edwards movie. How the hell is King Kong going to stand up to him? They're going to make him bigger and it's a new take on it and we'll accept it because we need him to be he won't be as big as Godzilla, but he'll enough to where he's going to be able to hold his own and that's all I want to see, but just give him other monsters that he's going to be able to fight. That I just want it to look as long as it looks cool, as long as I, I believe that the CGI is going to be pretty incredible for this particular movie, 
And I don't want to see the new tale, the way that they're going to spin this. And I and we talked about this with the shared monsters universe that they were doing with with Tom Cruise and Russell mm -hmm. Crowe and all that. I always welcome a brand new shared universe if it fits together. That's not Star Wars or Marvel because I want to see other. I think it's it's yeah. something really cool to do and to, able to transplant Godzilla and and King Kong and like you're mm -hmm. mentioning Pacific Rim and all these things. It could be done really really well. So this movie I'm excited for and I also agree with you that we're getting some kind of trailer or something that I hope will be released to the public also uh, at the Warner Brothers panel on Saturday I believe it is. Mm -hmm. um, so Dennis, how do you feel about these images? Yeah, I, I like this image. It, it Visually you can see the scale of it and see like what your guys are talking about where they want to scale up King Kong. Mm -hmm. I wonder if they'll scale down Godzilla any to try and compensate for that size difference at all. Um, I, I like their re not retelling the same Beauty and the Beast story like Peter Jackson already did. You know, and also I hope that they don't do what Peter Jackson did, which was take what was like 45 minutes to an hour just to get to the yeah, island. Right. Hopefully it's like, I, they don't have to start off on the island, but you know, maybe 15, 20 minutes and then get into it. We don't. We don't need a whole forty-five minute hour intro. Yeah, King Kong for me, Peter Jackson's version. I think you. you and I'm not even joking. You trim about an hour off that movie, and it's a great movie. Trim the first hour off that movie, and it's a great movie. <laughs> well, I just. Yeah. I mean, it's just there's so much. That it takes a while. Once they get mm -hmm. to the island, it's. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, that stupid dinosaur scene. The yeah. not, <laughs> not the one where King Kong's fighting the dinosaur. That part's mm -hmm. awesome. But when they're getting chased, oh, the, oh. the stampede looks ridiculous. Um, <laughs> okay, what's next? J.K. Rowling's eagerly anticipated Harry Potter spinoff, Fantastic Beasts and where to find them doesn't come out until November, but according to director David Yates, the author has already written a sequel script to the movie. Speaking to Entertainment Weekly, Yates said the movie is quite different from the first saying, we've seen the script for part two for the second movie, which takes the story in a whole new direction. As you should, you don't want to repeat yourself. The second movie introduces new characters as she builds this part of the Harry Potter universe further. It's a very interesting development from where we start out. The work is pouring out of her. Fantastic Beasts expands the Potter universe, this time setting it in America with a story set in 1926 New York as Newt Scamander, played by Eddie Redmayne, scrambles to recapture his escape beast. It opens in theaters on November 18th. Christian, thoughts on a Fantastic Beasts 2 script already written by J.K. Rowling? Doesn't surprise me at all. The woman is a monster when it comes to writing, and they're not dumb. No, you mean Fantastic they, Beast. She's a Fantastic she's, Beast. Yeah, uh, she is. But they, you, know, you know that they... they of course this movie is going to make gangbusters at the box office. It's going to do so well. It's going to carry over the Harry Potter lore. Of course she's going to be working on it. She's also, that's how her mind works. She knows she knows where she's, oh, okay, those, that character has to go this. And, and she starts writing it. Great. That gets, that gets me so optimistic for the series. That there, there's a clear cut vision. They're not just making it up as they go. She's already got part two. And I love, and she always does that. She changes the tone as things do change with these characters. And as you're gonna, the, even you look at the first two Columbus movies, even though granted different director, but you have the tone of those movies shifted as the age got older. So there's certain things that they're exploring that the tone will shift. I don't know, it had, did they announce how many of these are doing? Is it a trilogy? Uh, I think they want I've, to do yeah, a trilogy. I've heard a trilogy, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if they already announced the fact they're doing a trilogy and she's got the second one done, let's get the production going because if this one is as great as we hope it's going to be, we're going to go, give me more, 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 more. Well, don't worry, script's done. How do you feel about it? I, I feel really good about it because I think Fantastic Beasts is the Harry Potter spinoff that I want because I, I, I kind of feel that Harry Potter's story, even though they're doing that play in London right now that's essentially Harry Potter 8, I kind of feel Harry B. Voldemort, Harry's story's over. So, like, this new spinoff into America with a new character and stuff like that, that's exciting to me because I'm like, we never saw America in that world. And the fact that she obviously wrote this one with being like, well, I got ideas for the second one. And you're like saying she already kind of knows where it is. Yep. And that thinks that this script, she already knows where three is going to go. That to me should mean that this should be a pretty interwoven and strong trilogy. I'm also not surprised that she already wrote the second one. I, I can't remember who it was, but it was someone in the in our industry on my Facebook had kept, keep saying that they think that Fantastic Beasts is going to bomb. And I'm like, are you kidding me? No like, I think they think that because Harry Potter himself is not in it, and I understand people love Harry Potter, but even you just look at Universal Studios, right, with the theme park. 
people are it's in love world. with the world. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. they love the world. That's why they keep going there, and that's why they will go see this movie. Well, Were they thinking it was sort of like a Hobbit thing, like with the Hobbit compared to Lord no, of the Rings? No, they thought it was gonna bomb, bomb, okay. like like no one was gonna go see mm-hmm. it. It's oh, like, like you to, are like you're, you're mistaken. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're mistaken. <laughs> people love this world, yeah. and even though it's not Harry Potter himself, it's the world, and they want to see all that stuff. All right, now it's time for Buy or Sell. Ashley Mover is going to read some more topics in the world of movie news. And myself, Jason, and Dennis, you're going to buy or sell it. Ashley, what are we buying or selling? While Star Trek Beyond opens in theaters this week, producer J.J. Abrams is already planning a fourth entry in the rebooted franchise. Today came official word that Paramount Pictures, Skydance, and Bad Robot will bring the crew of the USS Enterprise back to the big screen for another voyage with one new interesting development. Chris Pine's Captain Kirk will cross paths with the man he never had a chance to meet, but whose legacy has haunted him since the day he was born, his father. Chris Hemsworth, who appeared in 2009 Star Trek, will return to the space saga as George Kirk, starring alongside Pine with the remaining cast expected to return. It was J.J. Abrams who originally broke the news, revealing to Access Hollywood Scott Mance that Chris Hemsworth would in fact return. The series' third film, Star Trek Beyond, directed by Justin Lin, will open in theaters this Friday, July 22nd. Dennis Byersall, Chris Hemsworth returning as Kirk's dad in Star Trek 4. Uh, I'm definitely buying this. Before they made the announcement this morning, we had heard about this over the weekend, and the big question was, was it just going to be a cameo, or was he going to have a more substantial role? Well, that's answered now. If he's co-starring, people have to remember, Chris Hemsworth, when he came out in the first uh, Star Trek reboot, no one knew who he was. He, he was, wasn't Thor yet. He wasn't yeah, yeah. Thor. He wasn't a big star. He hasn't really carry over in terms of like star power yet. In ter- uh, what, what was that uh, Ron Howard movie that he he just uh, did last uh, year? Not in, Rush, in the Heart of the right, Sea. Right, right. Like he, that didn't do that well. Mm-hmm. Uh, Black Hat didn't do that well. But as Thor, he's been doing pretty big numbers. It's in. I want to see this especially because this indicates a time travel story for Star Trek, and we haven't got one of those in the movies in a, in a long time. Well, I mean, they did use kind of time travel in the first reboot in a, in a mm-hmm. bit, you know, because yeah. they altered yeah. time yeah, and stuff Yeah, more like too. alternate dimensions. Well, kind of, yeah. I mean, even because you have the, the late, you know, obviously, Nimoy, Leonard Nimoy, Leonard Nimoy mm-hmm. came in and, and he he was part of the time travel, I guess, experiment, the alternate universe. But yeah, yeah, not specific time travel. It just depends on how they do it. I will. I'm going to buy it. Because I like the idea, and I like the fact that Scott Mance almost lost his mind when it went. <laughs> the video was hilarious. <laughs> what? 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 <laughs> what? <laughs> are, are, are you joking? <laughs> um, yeah. So it was. Uh, it absolutely is something that could be cool, and, and they're going to capitalize off of Hemsworth for yeah. sure. It just how they're going to do it. If the time travel is done well, and I'll tell you, I mean, I just put my review for Star Trek Beyond on Schmoes, um, so you guys can watch that afterwards. But I, I really enjoyed the movie I did and I and it's funny because I'm not a big Star Trek guy the old school Star mm-hmm. Trek for sure but and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong here but this to me felt more like the original Star Trek the original 100 then yeah then the other ones and I actually liked that about it even though I loved what I loved about the first reboot was the fact that it felt a little bit more Star Wars yeah this this felt more like the old TV show more than the old TV shows movies did yeah it was like a, it was <laughs> I said it was like a small movie in a big movie's body mm-hmm. and I, and I liked that about it the adventures that they went on in this movie so what's the next story to tell is it this time travel story to because he, he does of course make reference to his dad once again so are they gonna do that how are they gonna do that but I'll buy it because I think it sounds interesting I, I'm, I'm a total buy as well. I think this is one of those ideas that once I heard it, I was like, it makes total sense. Why right. haven't? Why did they wait for movies to do this? But like, I kind of understand that. There is actually an episode of Star Trek: The Next Generation called Yesterday's Enterprise, which is all about this old ship that comes out of the timeline and shows up in present day. And as soon as it shows up, the entire timeline changes. And I think if they took the the basis of that storyline and threw it into like, so his dad appears in the future, it may be in the Kelvin, we don't know. And if you make the whole movie about that they have to go on an adventure and Captain Kirk has to send his dad back to his death to ensure the timeline, like, that is gonna break your heart, just like the opening scene of two thousand nine. You know when they meet though in this in this future movie, they're gonna hate each other, right? From the 100%. beginning, they're gonna be like, oh, they're gonna think each other are, are a bunch of dicks. And speaking of Scott, <laughs> a bunch of uh, speaking of Scott Vance, he's gonna be on uh, the top ten show this week. We're counting he down is. the the yes. top ten Star Trek films with uh, Roca, <laughs> yeah. Mance, and Nose. What? It, 
It's, what? It's, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, you have Ro- yeah, we, look, we already filmed it. It's, it, it. it's nuts. Look, Roca and Mance, if you didn't know, they had the best <laughs> Schmodown match of all time, and they're going up against each other again on August 12th, and they obviously get into it on the top 10 show, so it's a must-watch. I watched your best! <laughs> all right, what's, uh, what's next? At Star- uh, it appears that Disney and Lucasfilm plans for the Indiana Jones franchise will go far beyond just one more movie. While speaking at the panel, The Art of Storytelling, at Star Wars Celebration Europe, ILM President Linwin Brennan spoke about the Indiana Jones movie, saying, Kiri Hart and her group have mapped out a story and timeline across multiple platforms many years in advance, many exhausting years in advance. We have a great honor to have responsibility for, so we want to be really careful with that, not only for Star Wars, but with Indiana Jones, which we're all, we're all really excited about as well. Sorry, Brennan seems to suggest that the story group so. is also <laughs> coming up with long-term story plans for Indiana Jones with a possible interconnected Indiana Jones movie universe, along with video games and TV spinoffs. Whether that means sequels or prequels that delve deeper into Jones's backstory remains to be seen. Jason, buy or sell a shared Indiana Jones universe. I'm very curious to hear what you gentlemen will say because I say sell. Okay. Um, but I will say bye if we recast Indiana Jones because I do not want the interconnected shared geriatric Indiana Jones <laughs> universe. I do not want it. I did not like Crystal Skull. I do not want more of that. But uh, and, I, and I've said this on, on Movie Talk before that if you were to turn Indiana Jones into a James Bond franchise with like every four to five movies, we recast Indiana Jones and it's just a new different adventure. And we can go, there was a TV show, Young Indiana Jones. If we do that where we can see different Indiana Jones, I will totally buy this because I think there are so many different mythologies that Indiana Jones can touch that he hasn't touched yet. But if it's about keeping Harrison Ford well paid until his into his retirement, then I'm a sell. Um, I'm going to buy it because I think my idea is coming to fruition. And I've been singing these praises for uh, hoping this is going to happen. I, I've been saying this for like a year or two years. What I think they should do, and uh, they should start off with Indiana Jones 5 with Harrison Ford. In that movie, do something that they did similar with The Last Crusade with River mm-hmm. Phoenix. Flashback to whether it's Chris Pratt, Bradley Cooper, whoever the new Indiana Jones is. Give me a scene inside of that movie that's going to tell me, hey, when we do young Indiana Jones down the line, that's the guy that's going to be playing them. So I think you can do that. Transfer over. Introduce me to new characters that I care about that I want to see new movies about. Mm-hmm. If there's someone really cool, a new he's got someone, a new sidekick or, or someone that really helps his adventures. Well, imagine they recast Sala. Whoever, yeah. like whoever they do, they find new adventures of someone that they want, they, they're going to make me care about the spinoff. But I think that the feature, the, what they should focus on is Harrison Ford and this young Indiana Jones, whoever it's going to be. I do think they can still do more Indiana Jones with Harrison Ford, okay. but they have to still continue it on doing more, like more flashbacks. Each one that gets, so you start, you start. Well, I'm so serious. Harrison Ford has less and less to do. Yeah. <laughs> more or less, because you're, you're, that's the way you kind of pass the torch. Yeah. It, it's, if the first one is, an, is it Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones with a snippet of, then then it's like a half and half. And then it's like, oh, it's because mentioning that show that you, that you the young, the young Indiana Jones, Jones yeah. there was an episode with Harrison Ford in the yep. very beginning and he's in he's kind of flashbacks to it and he's in it for that that long and the full episode is about the, it's uh, what's his name Flaherty I guess who was the guy who played Indiana Jones mm-hmm. but anyway so that's the way I hope it happens and I feel like they're doing that even if they go into the TV show I wonder if they're gonna get the same actor to play Indy that they get in the films well I, I'm surprised I'm gonna agree with Jason over that like I'm only gonna buy it if they recast with a younger Indiana Jones I love Harrison Ford but mm-hmm. we don't need to force him to go out there like every <laughs> so we're all saying the same <laughs> thing no really. but but for you yeah. uh, the difference is I only want to see Harrison Ford in the next movie yes I'm that's with it. I'm a dentist just one, one more movie, time one more time that's it send it off turn it over mm-hmm. and then everything else all this TV spin-off video games or whatever else they want to make the shared universe base it around whoever they cast next and then 
Yeah, I just don't want to see him running out there. Like he, he already got injured on on Star Wars. He was <laughs> he, he wasn't even doing anything. <laughs> well, he was avoiding the Millennium Falcon door. Yeah. Is what he was doing. Um, <laughs> all right, what's next? Entertainment Weekly has released some official concept art for Blade Runner Two, the Denis Villeneuve sequel to Ridley Scott's influential original. Villeneuve spoke to EW about accepting the offer to direct the film, saying he's seen the original movie a thousand times. Villeneuve also revealed that the new film will take place several decades after the original, saying that in the movie, the climate has gone berserk. The ocean, the rain, the snow is all toxic, giving fans now a sense of how Dark Villeneuve sees his Blade Runner. As for the concept art, he explains that the vehicle in the second image is a kind of snow destroyer that roams around the futuristic Los Angeles. Blade Runner 2 is currently set for release on October 5th, 2017. Christian, buy or sell the new concept art for Blade Runner 2. Buy it. Man, do I buy it. It looks, it looks like... Everything I want the Blade Runner reboot to look like, I'm pretty sure, I would assume Deacons is shooting this, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man, Deacons shooting that. Yes, please. Yes, please. It looks incredible. It looks like set up just hearing the background of what it is. I'm getting very excited for this remake. And look, I even have my Sicario t-shirt on to prove how much I'm looking forward to these guys working together again. So I love the way this is looking. And I just get super excited because I'm a Deacons fanboy. To, to know that he's going to be bringing this to mm -hmm. life, huge buy for me. I buy the concept art as well. Unlike Schnepp, though, I'm not a huge Blade Runner fanboy. Like, I like the film, but I haven't seen it in years. Like, I just, I don't worship at the altar of, of Blade <laughs> Runner. But yeah. because Villeneuve and Deacons are doing this, that's what makes me excited. And, you know, talking about the different climate. And so we're going to see something familiar, but also different at the same time. I'm with Dennis. I, I will buy the art and I will buy the, like Roger Deakins. It's probably gonna make this a really, really pretty movie. Yeah. I just hope that the story can match the visuals. Mm -hmm. All right, now it's time for Mailbag. We are going to get into the questions that you guys have asked just simply at collidervideo at gmail.com. Ashley? What are they asking? Xander Tanigawa writes, What's up, Colliders? You guys and girls are doing a good job on the show and happy to hear that you'll be coming to Comic-Con. My question is, do you think studios will or should be worried that their blockbuster or summer movie will not make more money than they think at the box office due to the addiction of fans going out, walking, playing Pokemon <laughs> Go instead of going to the movies? <laughs> <laughs> are you guys and girls worried about this too? When I walked to the AMC 16 Burbank, there weren't a lot of people in line buying tickets, but instead saw more people outside playing Pokemon Go in front of the theater. Love to hear your thoughts. P.S. I play Pokemon Go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I am in love with this question <laughs> so much because it's so bizarre. It's so bizarre yeah. because you think about it. Hey, do you think it's weird people are outside? And do you think it's weird? I mean, and yeah, we're outside, but they're outside on phones looking yeah. for Pokemon. Yeah. Um, so it's it's really interesting, but no, I don't think, maybe, maybe for... A couple, uh, I mean, the demographic that's going out to see, yeah, I mean, the majority of movie, uh, the audience that they're going for is is playing Pokemon. But the, I think that if someone really <laughs> wants to see a movie, they're going to see it. And I also think that eventually, like anything does, the fad will kind yeah. of yeah. come down and and we'll go back to normal. So I, I don't think that they're that freaked out about Pokemon. How do you feel about it? I mean, television didn't kill movies. Streaming right. didn't kill movies. Right. Pokemon Go is not going to kill movies. I, and, I mean, I do, I do love your question that people are like, people are going outside. This is nuts. But people are still going outside looking at a screen. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah, yeah you, you and uh, <laughs> Schnapp and uh, I think Ellis got got some heat last week when you guys talked about Pokemon Go. Oh, because we're old as shit. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's basically what it comes. They're like, down you to. guys are a bunch of old geezers. I get it. I yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't. I wasn't taken away from anybody. Who who's playing yeah. it and have fun but just I it's like my dad working Skype he's like what's a bug spray back there what was that what's happening yeah uh, what the I, hell is I, a charm I personally don't play it either <laughs> I, I think it's a situation where it's not this one thing is gonna do it it's a mixture of stuff you know people are watching Netflix at home people are playing video games people are watching YouTube videos and this right. is just part of that and like you said it is a fact I don't think like this 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 type of game is going to go away they'll make new ones they'll make a new pokemon go go to they'll make uh, different properties that mm -hmm. that use the same kind of concepts but it will die down i remember when um that game fallout shelter came out where you like build your own vault and you build mm -hmm. vault. i was like obsessed with that game i was playing it all the time 
eventually you get to a point in the game where it's just you you, you can't do anything anymore and i mm -hmm. think that's what's going to happen with pokemon go and they'll make some other game you know like some some other property and people will play that but i don't think it's going to take away from the movie market uh, okay, what's next? Sean Warren writes, Hi Collider, big fan. With the two Star Wars spinoffs coming out and the rumored Boba Fett movie soon after, could they do the Boba Fett movie without ever showing his face? I know we found out who he was in episode two, but do it in a way like Dread and V for Vendetta, where he can still be menacing and badass, but relatable like V. Thanks for the daily overdose of news and keep it up. Um, I hope... They, if they if they do anything with Boba Fett, I hope that they do it the way you're suggesting. I also am hoping that there is absolutely no Boba Fett movie. We don't need one. And I, I think that it's lost kind of the luster from when this new... I think more people are calling for different movies now. And I think that if you see Boba Fett, you're going to see him more in whether it be a Netflix series or whether it's a new animated series and keeping up with exactly what you're saying, keep the mystery behind him. And I think they should keep the helmet on him. I still hope, kind of hope that they announce down the line that it's kind of like a Dread Pirate Roberts thing to mm. where you, you have it's just someone keeps taking up the mantle of Boba Fett I'd rather you don't think he could be like the villain in the Han Solo movie um, I think that he could be something but I'm, mm -hmm. this is talking about like a standalone okay. like, I think mm -hmm. Boba Fett will show up in the Han Solo movie and he doesn't necessarily have to be the villain because Han doesn't fall out of favor with Jabba Fett job of the hut until later on mm -hmm. anyway so you know he's on a bounty to catch a Han so they might even be Partners. paired up at one yeah. point so he was a, he was a merc so I, I I'm curious to what they're going to do with him I don't need a full story on him but I do think they should keep the helmet on him how do you feel I, I agree with you I think it would be amazing if they kept the helmet on him I just don't think in the Hollywood system that we're in they're going to I think they're gonna cast yeah. the name I actually do want to see a Boba Fett movie because I think it could be the Suicide Squad of the Star Wars universe. Like you could do, like I mean, imagine we see all those bounty hunters. In Empire Strikes Back. What if we had a movie that starred all of them? I think that would be fantastic. And they're all fighting for the same bounty. I think that movie would be different enough from the main episodes that I'd be really interested. Um, again, I would love it if they did the dread, the dread style with it, but I don't think they're going to. Yeah, I'm more into the idea of having the, the Bounty Hunters movie that you're talking about as opposed to a solo uh, Boba Fett mm. movie. But even Dread, though, yeah, you couldn't see his eyes, but at least you could Saw see his mouth. His mouth. Yeah, yeah, you know, right. he could smile. He could, you know, he'd do all these different things. With Boba Fett, it's just straight it. nothing. Yeah. So I think you're right. The studios, uh, Disney is not going to allow that to happen. What was it Manu Bennett? Is that how you, you pronounce his name? Manu Bennett? Yeah. Yeah. I think he'd be a great Boba Fett if they were going to do it. Yeah, um, the Deathstroke from Arrow, yeah. Yeah, I think he would be a great Boba Fett. I don't know if they would cast him, but even in that... The I'd even Chronicles believe that he was the son of Django, too. Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. he has the same look. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean. So mm -hmm. the Chronicles, of Chronicles of Shankara, whatever that thing yeah. is. Yeah, Shankara. I, Shinara Chronicles, oh, I think. God bless you. I, um, <laughs> I saw the, the pilot of that. I didn't love the pilot, but I really liked him. I thought he was great in that pilot, and I think that he's someone that could do it if you're going to explain more. So, mm -hmm. we'll Did you ever watch Spark? Spartacus? He was in Spartacus. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Like I watched Christus. the first episode. I know everyone says the first episode. Yeah. Was, well, the first several episodes garbage. are terrible. And then, and then it gets, it gets Yeah, it does. Yeah. Okay, before we move on to live Twitter questions, we're only going to be able to take around two live Twitter questions today. We're going to check in on the Wendy cam. Wendy, what have they been saying thus far? Well, in our buy or sell section, they're talking about Chris Hemsworth returning as Kirk's dad in Star Trek IV. So right now they're selling this since we all know what happened to him. So unless it's a prequel, the chat's not really into this. I'm also seeing some uh, speculation that maybe Q has something to do with this. Marquez Dobson says, I will bite this despite how confused I am about how George Kirk will be in it for more than just flashbacks. And also for the Disney maybe interconnecting the uh, Indiana Jones universe, the chat's also selling this, saying, why does everything have to be a shared universe? Again, um, they're saying the studio is getting ahead of themselves, and let's just make the Indiana Jones 5 good first. Kaoli Lee, sorry, I just butchered your name. She says, sell Indiana Jones until they reboot. I love Ford, but it's time to put the fedora down. <laughs> Poor Indy. Okay, <laughs> let's go to live Twitter questions. Let's do two today. Oh, Ashley, right. what do we got? Kylo Ren and Stimpy nice. writes, like Fantastic Beasts and Doctor Strange both come out in November. Which fantasy film will win the box office? Does it come out the same weekend? Ooh, yeah. No, I think one comes out the 4th eight, and one comes out the 18th. I Ooh. guess they, maybe they mean overall. What, overall what's going to make the most money. 
I, th- I think Fantastic Beasts. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Especially if you count international as well. Like yeah. Doctor Strange is an unknown quantity. I mean, no, I know it's Marvel. I know people will watch. Uh, a lot of people will watch just. Anything but I still Marvel think he's a tough sell for yeah. the Marvel yeah, audience. Yes. Yeah. you know, it's a different. It, it is. It's. It's. I think that this. I. St- I think that Doctor Strange could have the possibility of being one of the best Marvel movies, but also the, one of the least profitable because mm-hmm. I think that it is. It's very specific, and it might creep some people out. I think that the Harry Potter world will bring in a lot. of of audience from people who were fans of the first one who read all the mm-hmm. all the books and not 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 you know all the Harry Potter books and to get reconnected with this world similar to what you were saying yeah. before with the people that are flocking to the Harry Potter world so I do think Fantastic and Beasts. you know they'll stamp that Harry Potter name all over of Fantastic oh, yeah, Beasts yeah. from Harry Potter you yeah, know yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have no doubt that like Fantastic Beasts will be in like the top five until Rogue One yeah, yeah. oh the music I mean even in the trailer Harry Potter's not in it, but it's because <laughs> yeah. they want to let you know it's part of it. Uh, all right, last one. All right, The Lone Wolf writes, what's the biggest selling point of a film for you? Cast, story, director, or genre? Uh, it depends. Uh, it, it just I, depends. Generally, for me, it's always, it's, it's director is the first thing I look at. Mm. It Like, it used to, you know, back in the day, it used to be the cast, but, you know, then you get people who are fantastic actors that just, do steaming piles of yeah. crap. It just depends. I mean, it, for me, it's like if if there's a particular story that sounds interesting or genre that sounds interesting, and then I go, well, who's directing it? Okay, that sounds interesting. And it just, it, yeah, for me, it changes all the time depending on what it is or what the, tra- I mean, because what's that the trailer that came out, for example, last week? What was the one? La La Land. Uh, mm. uh, Damien Chazelle. Yes. And when that comes out, at first, I'm going, okay, well, I like Ryan Gosling, so let me see what this is all about. Oh, Damien Chazelle. That, okay, now I'm a little bit more intrigued. Then I see the trailer. Then I hear the music. It, it, there's just a lot of factors that go into it. Yeah, I'm the same way as you, Christian. But for me, I would say that my top two are either uh, the story or the director. Because I, I have had a trailer convince me to go see a movie that, that had actors that I hated in it and a director that I didn't like. And I found out that I loved it. Because... I'm willing to let the trailer convince mm-hmm. me, but before that, if I hear about a movie, like I base it off the director. Like if I like that director's previous works, then that's probably going to be a movie that I'm interested in. But like I said, I, like, I try to keep an open mind, and if a trailer can convince me, I'll go see the movie. Oh yeah, I mean I keep an open mind for everything. It's just director's the first yeah. thing I look at. Okay, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. That's our show. I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today on the panel. First, Wendy Lee over the Wendy Cam. Where can I find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. The modest assassin himself, Dennis Zhang. Where can they find you? <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Jason Inman, who will be facing me in the Schmodown August 5th. Where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Jawin, J A W I I N, and on my podcast on iTunes, uh, Geek History Lesson. Ashley Mova, where can the kids find you? Well, I just made a Snapchat, so I'm officially a millennial. Oh, um, right. So you guys can find me on there and Twitter and Instagram, Ashley Mova. Happy Monday, guys. Well, like I mentioned to you guys, live Jedi Council happening today around 1 p.m. So come back here and join myself, John Campia, and Mark Riley as we break down Star Wars Celebration, get into a bunch of stuff that happened from the weekend. You can all, I mentioned the Schmodown. John Schnepp returns to the ring as he goes up against Kale Anonymous. That's going to be an interesting match. Match this Friday. Make sure you go and check that out. We've got the Rebels reaction that Dennis did with Campia. We've got all the stuff that I covered with Perry over the weekend. Heroes is doing a special Comic-Con special this Wednesday. Lots of stuff going down, and don't forget the meet and greet happening at Comic-Con on Thursday from 5 to 9. Yeah. And make sure you check all that stuff out. And check me out, Christian Harloff, Twitter and Instagram. And we'll catch you tomorrow. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.